It reminds me of the part in the Course where Jesus says, Miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control. I remember when I first was reading that, I said, involuntary? Wow. You know. And then, the more I got into practicing it, I could see that when I got into the peace, it was more just like I, I was observing things, but there was this, this sense of a conscious choice. Do this, don't do this, and so on and so forth. It, was, it, it just eased and relaxed into this flow. It's kind of like the story where the lady comes up and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And he's like, who touched me? It says instantaneously she was made whole. He's like, who touched me? You know, it's like, or don't let the one hand know what the other hand is doing, kind of, you know, in the Bible. It's this involuntary sense that he says miracles should actually be, be habits. You know, when, you, when you're in a habit, it's not like you're consciously thinking of doing something. It's just, it just becomes a habit. Well, he's saying miracle thinking should become habitual. So habitual, in the end, that you can't think of a problem. You don't first diagnose something and say, okay, pray on it and let's work, work hard to change it. You actually get so back into the flow with, with the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit looks not to effects, it says in the Course. He has, he has overlooked the cause. In other words, if there was a little dot that was the ego, and an entire cosmos, the screen of the world, was projected out from that dot, the Holy Spirit looks not to effects. The Holy Spirit looks not to the cosmos. But He has overlooked the erroneous cause that seemed to make the erroneous effect. And this is why when you pray for specifics, or you pray for effects to be a certain way, you're really praying as if there's something real going on out there and it needs to be changed or fixed and missing the idea that the very belief that, that projected it out in the first place is wrong, it's, it's an error. So that's why the Course says, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Because if you tinker around with the effects, it's like trying to clog up a dam you know, that's breaking. You could put little plugs of clay all the way down, but it's just going to keep popping, popping, popping. This is saying, no, go inside and face this erroneous cause and realize that it's not a real cause. Because God didn't create it. He didn't create the, God didn't create the ego, and God didn't create the time-space cosmos that the ego projected as a hiding, a smokescreen, as a, as a deceptive hiding shield. God didn't create either one. And as long as you keep believing the effects are real, the ego has got you trapped. It would, literally, I use this example all the time, it would be like going to a movie theater and, you know, where there's like a, a glitch in the film and seeing this, this jagged little picture on the screen in the front of the movie theater and literally getting out of your seat and walking down to the screen and banging on the screen thinking that is going to correct the glitch. You have to get back in the projector room. You have to see where the problem actually is because it wouldn't matter how long you bang there and say to people, come on, get out of your seats, come and bang with me. Let's, let's see if we can solve this. Get the whole theater up here banging, you know, and it's still going like this because, of course, we, we know from that analogy they aren't even close to it. They, until they get back to the projector, they aren't even close to solving this glitch thing. And that's what you start to realize in relationships, in all your dealings with the world, that you have to come back 